chapter 6 in the red chapter, or red chapter, red chair Bible, that's page 1213 and 1214. See, I did my homework. Let's start off with verse 1. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle the dispute between the brothers? But brothers go, brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your precious word that leads us and guides us into everlasting truth. And Father, that transforms us and renews us by the uh, Spirit that's within us. That gives us hope, Father, to be ever present with you. Lord, we know that your, your words... Or yes and amen for those that you call your children. And Father, I pray that your children would have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive what you have in store this morning. Speak to your servant now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning thinking I'd probably get an extra t couple hours of like studying. And then I looked. Opened up my iPad, and I looked at my notes, and it was bright white. You know, like Mater, you guys know cars, where he says the ghost light? That's kind of the fear that I had when I saw that my notes were gone. Somehow I kind of deleted it all. Yeah, so I was panicking this morning. It was okay. Um, nothing to it. But I ended up spending most, most of my time trying to rebuild what I could remember off of my slides, and so hopefully... I'm not going to have Jocelyn running for her money um, this morning. So, but as we know, as we're looking here, um, and as Clint has been discussing with us and teaching us through chapter 5, Paul is, he's not really changing the subject from the topic of chapter 5. Uh, he's just kind of deviating. He, he, he started talking about sexual immorality with the, with the, 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 the guy marrying his um, mother-in-law. Um, and then how the Corinthians were proud of it, which was not good. They were boasting in their sinful natures. So um, what this alludes to is what we see on, on, the, on this first slide is a failure of the church to be the church. A failure of the church to be the church. And I, I'm asking you guys to really just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and, and, and convict you where it needs to, be, needs to be convicted, correct you, grow. And if you can say, amen, amen. If it's ouch, then figure out what that ouch is and, and correct it in Jesus' name. So what Paul's trying to do now is he's summoning the, the, the church as, with this letter to try and get an understanding of themselves. First and foremost, one is saints. As the eschatological people, we are the promised children of God. We are the end times um, called, called of God. <clears throat> out of darkness, out of this world, out of their social world or their previous social world, just like Israel uh, was called out of Egypt. 
What that means is that they're now bound. They're now bound together as a people in a way that requires them to modify themselves away from their former ways. And that's what the Word of God does, just like as I just prayed. The Word of God transforms us by the renewing of our mind. As we grow deeper into the knowledge of the gospel of grace, our heart no longer becomes a heart of darkness, but it comes, becomes a heart of light and of truth. And we walk in that way. So Paul addresses this by giving several questions. And they're progressive in, in, in order uh, and how he, he delivers this to the, uh, against the unbelievers, how we are to conduct our, ourselves. We're not supposed to be going to the heathen. But Paul's using this as the court. Where he's describing the court and how he's saying that, you know, brother goes against brother. It's not that he's saying that we shouldn't be going to the, to, 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 to the court to, dis, to uh, deliberate d- uh, disputes, because Paul does it. He, he actually uses his Roman citizenship to appeal to Caesar, right? So he's not saying that the law in itself, the Roman law, is, is unjust or unrighteous or whatever to that fact. But when it comes to the saints, to the children of the Most High God, we have a different standard that we live by. And we're going to get into that. So these, these six questions that, I, that Paul raises here, as we go through them, the end... The end reason, or I'm hoping that we can come to this, um, as he says at the end, this primary principle as in our Christian faith is the believer ought to suffer wrong rather than run the risk of doing wrong. That's going to be a hard sell for a lot of us. So question one, do you dare go before the unjust world instead of saints to settle legal matters between your brother? Question two, Do you not know your high and exalted authority? Three, do you choose unbelievers as judges who have no standing in the church? Hopefully we'll get to these three questions today. Four, is there not a wise man in the church? Then five, why not give in? Suffer being uh, cheated rather than running the risk of cheating a brother. And then the last question, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So let's tackle the first question in verse 1. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? So in the Greek, this is a forceful statement. Paul is really getting at him. He's not just saying, hey, eh. it's not wishy-washy here. He's actually saying in, in, the, in this, you, you moms and you dads, when you talk to your kids and they do something wrong, what do you guys say when you say, and it, and it really offends you? How dare you, right? How, <laughs> di- how di- <laughs> I didn't think it was going to be that funny, but how dare you, right? Um, Paul's not, he's not throwing any punches there. He's really saying, how dare you go before the unrighteous? You that are made righteous, you're going to the unrighteous. You're going to the unjust. How dare you, who are the saints of God, go to the law, the secular law of this world? We're not supposed to be disputing and arguing over rights and authority, nor over the things and possessions of, of, our, of our day, what we've gotten. Look at, in the book of Acts 2, 42 to 47. If you guys are familiar with this, this is the, the birth of the church. 42 to 47 Luke writes, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, were together, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending in the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. The church was divided in Corinth. They were messed up compared to the way the church started. And Paul's giving it to him. So 
look at it in this context, right? Um, the church was so conflicting with their parties, these two believers seeking secular judgment um, was not good. The other note, these secular judges, as, as it reads in here, that uh, he says, go, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous? This is not saying that, it's not saying that the, uh, these, these judges or these, these Greeks, they were, you get, who's, whose phone is that? I'm, I'm just kidding. Put on silent, please. I thought it was back here. <laughs> Who said I don't even hear it? Okay, so the the unjust or the unrighteous. This doesn't mean that the world's judges were le legally unjust. That's not what Paul's uh, getting at. It's not saying that that, that Christians are going to get an unfair trial. It's just referring that to unbelievers as a class of people who are unjust or unjustified before God. How can those that are not redeemed or regenerate, that who are rejecting God's law, who are rejecting even the very existence of God, rule and justly proclaim right ruling before the righteous, those that are made right, those that are standing before a holy and just God redeemed? So, believers, us, the church, we're supposed to be settling our disputes between ourselves, among ourselves. We're supposed to be governed by the life of Christ and the law of God, his word. In God's eyes, it's wrong for believers to go to law against each other. It's really wrong. And there's three points that I want to bring up. But before I do that, I want to pull up the map to give you guys, before we get to these three points, I want to show you this map to give you an idea of what the court looks like in their day. You have what this is called is the Agora. This is the marketplace. And in this marketplace, we know what a marketplace is. is where sell you, you, it's, just the, the, it's like the major mall, right? Super mall in our day. <clears throat> in the middle of this marketplace was called the Bema. You guys are familiar with the Bema? The Bema is the seat in which a judge sits and, and, gives, and listens to the hearing or listens to the petitions from the people and gives a ruling. The Eastern Orthodox Church and Catholicism, the Bema is the raised platform um, on, of the altar. It's where they give uh, the communion. It's where they give their sermons. Uh, Judaism, the bima, is also a raised platform. That's the, that's the meaning of it, is raised platform. But the bima for the Jews, it's where the Torah was read and where the sermons were, were given. For us, this is our bima. When we're back there in Sunday school, that little podium, that is the bima. That is, this is where the Word of God is read to you, and taught to you, and where we do communion. Johnny did good, but we'll talk later. I'm just <laughs> So, um, but we're all familiar, I think you're all familiar, especially you sat in, in Mike's um, Revelation studies, the Bema Seat. When we think of Bema Seat, Bema Seat is the, the, the judgment seat that Christ sits on. Right? Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 5.10. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Then he talks about it in Romans 14 to the Romans. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. That's the Bema Seat. Now, the way things took place back then, it, before they got to this Bema Seat, <clears throat> people would come together and they would, go to, they would seek arbitration. If they had a disagreement, they would seek arbitration. What that entailed was three Greeks, old dudes at the age of 60, 
and they served on this arbitration team for about a year. When they turned 61, they were out, and they would, they would, they would arbitrate, one, one in favor of one side, the other on the favor of the other side, and the, and the guy in the middle, and then they would come, they'd come to arbitrate. If they didn't come to conclusion or peaceful remediation of whatever the dispute was, then they would go to court. They would go to this marketplace. How many of you guys think that our jury seats, 12, is, is too much? No? No one? Ever, ever. Back then, it could range up, I think one of the uh, his, historical records show that this jury trial, these jury trials could range up to 6,000 people. Try to come to a settlement then. That's crazy, right? So I think that the, what I'm trying to paint here is, is Corinth was so litigious. Am I saying that right? Litigious or litigious? They were just happy, trigger happy on going after their brother, going after their neighbor, just they wanted to sue someone. They were just trigger happy, right? Kind of reminds you of what we got going on today in our own country. The United States, this is a fun fact. The United States has more lawyers than any country in the world. You guys know that? New York and California have the most. No wonder they, I mean, they're... <laughs> They're so, so messed up. I was going to say a bad word. Sorry. Um, the amount of lawsuits that, are, that we generate, we actually come in fifth, right? Germany, Sweden, Austria, Israel, they beat us. Um, but that's still, I mean, that is a bad state of affairs of a country where everyone is looking to sue someone for something. I don't, I'm a, I don't remember, was it Johnny or someone? We were talking, and I don't know if you guys remember the, the lady that uh, sued McDonald's because, <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we have gone so, and that's why insurance is crazy. That's why, you know, everything has to have insurance. There's liability for everything, and everything costs so much because these lawyers, who's a lawyer in here? No one good, because I'm going to, no, you don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> so. Um, it's just a ra- really bad state of affairs. And in Corinth, it was really nasty. It was not good. And then for us to be children of the Most High God, separated be- before, the, uh, before the world, sanctified, <clears throat> here we are going to the unjust. We're not bearing good witness. Um, and I'm way going off my notes, but I think that's okay. Um, What's sad about all this is that Paul explains this, or he gives a great example. That what, what's going on in our country, and if you guys are on our Wednesday night studies, we've been going over Philippians. And Paul talks about this, how in, in Philippians 2, 3, he, talks, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. We're not doing that. Galatians 5, Jay talked about it. In the, in the Galatians study, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. We're not doing that. And when you go to court, that's the objective. You're trying to fling so much mud on the opposing argument to where it looks like it's not the truth. You're devouring one another. You're making someone else look bad for your own selfish ambitions, for your own gain. That's not what the church is supposed to be like. So the first point, we're talking about family of affairs. Paul says, how dare you take your family affairs before the unjust, the unrighteous, instead of the saints. Believers who settle differences before the world reproach and damage the name of Christ and the testimony of the church. There's no disputing this fact. It happens every time. There's no escape. The name of Christ is always hurt when believers carry their differences before the world. When we throw out our dirty laundry before everyone to see, it doesn't give, it bears false witness. It doesn't give Christ a great name. You guys know what the fruit of the Spirit is? What is it? Love. 
Yeah. And this, is, this fruit is what the world desperately needs. The world desperately needs to see the fruit of the Spirit, which is seeded in us. It grows from within us. But what the world receives from disputing Christians is anything but that. They don't see love. They see pride. Point two, believers who settle differences before the world fail the Lord and fail him miserably. How do they do this? They fail to govern their own affairs. They can't handle or manage their own disputes amongst one another. It is God's will for believers who have conflict to seek the guidance of his spirit and the church. Believers are to live by Christ and his word, not by the standards and the rules of this world. Believers are to, to be salt. They are to permeate the world, not the other way around. We are supposed to be the standard for the world. And like I said earlier, believers, we're supposed to be governed by the law of Christ, which is love. Love for our neighbor. The third point, believers have both the Holy Spirit and Christ-centered leaders to help them determine God's wisdom. You guys should remember, this is a pretty good, uh, a pretty popular uh, story in the book of John in the Gospels where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. You guys remember Nicodemus? He was a, a lawgiver. He was one of the, the chief rulers of Israel. Um, he was a Pharisee. Jesus told him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And this is what Paul gets to in the very end. Of, of this passage in verse, verse 11. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. We who are children of the Most High God are citizens of a kingdom that's not of this world. We belong to a kingdom that is pure and holy and righteous. And for us to be anything but that as we walk in this world, as we sojourn in this world, bearing false witness to our great King, our great Savior King, our Lord and Savior, that's not good. And how we live and what we can rely on is the, is the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we are born again, the Holy Spirit gives us discernment. The Holy Spirit speaks in and through us. He gives us insight into the law. The unjust, the unredeemed, they look at this, the Word of God, and they can't even, they can look at it, and they can probably come up to a, a logical conclusion, but they can't give you the divine inspired interpretation or, or meaning of what His Word means. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And the Holy Spirit provided His, His church with leaders. And his leaders are, are, have been charged with giving out instruction, giving out direction, giving out guidance, praying and laying hands on one another, on um, encouraging the brethren. And if we're not going to them for counsel, for, for, for deliberating disputes, what kind of witness are we bearing? What kind of love are we portraying to the world? So the church and its believers must begin to live as God and his word instructs. We learn to have a different lifestyle. The old ways are gone. Behold, all things have become new. All right, Paul talks about that in Corinth in Corinthians again. Is it 2nd 5? 2nd Corinthians 5:17? 
Has to be because 1 Corinthians 5 said that we just passed and it wasn't in it. So how dare you? Well, that was just chapter, that was verse 1. How long did I do? Oh, my goodness. Verse 2 and 3. Let's do a quick word study, and then we'll, we'll, we'll close here. <clears throat> do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? First word I want to look at is saint. The, the word saint means someone who is sanctified, someone who is set apart. You are sacred. You are holy. Like I said, you are set apart. You are, you are meant for an intended purpose for our Christ, our King. In Leviticus, Israel was instructed by God to create all kinds of utensils and all kinds of vassals, all kinds of things to, to, to be a part of, of the sac- ceremonial sacrifices that they were required to do. These tools and instruments, they were sacred. They were set apart. They were on, their only, only intended purpose was to be used for the worship of God. If you are a saint, your sole, imperp- your sole purpose, your intended purpose, by God's requirement and by God's desire, by God's will, is for you to worship Him. Your, your purpose is to glorify Him in this life, in this world. Let's talk about judging. Daniel 7. Daniel 7 says in chapter, in chapter 7, verse 22, Until the Ancient of Day comes, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. And then John writes about that in Revelation 20, verse 4, where he says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So that's why when I said we are eschatological people of God, this is our promise. We are going to rule and reign with Christ our King. We are not just people that are going to fill fill heaven and, and, and be issued our own cloud and our halo and just wander around, you know, willy-nilly and do whatever. This is God's kingdom. It's magnificent. It's marvelous. And we as the bride of Christ, we are going to rule and reign. Not only are we going to rule and reign this world and everything of it, we're going to rule and reign. And I, I, don't, have to see, I don't have time um, to go into the depths that I wanted to go on this as far as like ruling, with, ruling over angels is what Paul's talking about. But what I want to talk to you guys mainly about, and there's a slide that's coming up. Um, we'll get to it in a minute. <clears throat> but first, with judging, with judging, the word judging, crino. Clint talked about it a couple weeks ago. It means to govern, right? It means the right and power to govern, administer affairs, hold authority, supervise, <clears throat> oversee. This is our right as a church. This is our our, our function as a church. Now, when we look at all of this stuff, and, and, and this gets a little, uh, I think people get lost here, is when we look at, <clears throat> as far as I was talking about the unrighteous and the unjust, and how they can't look at the Word of God and discern it the, biblically or, or spiritually. <clears throat> and I want to I uh, bring up a point that, Jay has brought up with gnosko, the word gnosko, which is, um, it's knowledge. Gnosko means knowledge. It's a form of, of learning, either by experience or, or, or training. We can do that. We don't need the Spirit of God to do that. We were designed. We're imagers of God. We are created in His image. We have the, we have the ability to have knowledge. We are of the highest order of creation. Right, look at what we've, we've been able to do. <clears throat> In, in this world, all the technology that we've got going on. AI is great, right? <laughs> got you there. Um, the other word, which is more in, intimate, is, is Oida. 
oida. This is, this is known, or it's known by intuition. We talked a little bit about it at the men's group, and I was a little worried because we were getting into it, and I was like, oh, this is part of my study. Um, <clears throat> But it's, it's divine inspiration. It's a connection. It's, it's intimate relationship with the Spirit of God who gives you intuition, who speaks to you and shares with you a knowledge that you cannot attain any other way. It's only by the Spirit of God that the Word of God comes alive. So when we, we talk about judging, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're going to look at this as, as law-giving, as more of like ruling with an iron fist. That's not what the church is supposed to be doing. We rule with love, with compassion, with grace. Not tolerance, with grace. We don't allow sin to get carried away. We have to stand in front of it and say, no, enough's enough. You are a representation of Christ the King. Live like it. And when he says, talking about uh, ruling of angels, the next slide. I think we should go there, and then we'll end it. Yeah, next slide, please. So back to the map. <clears throat> so with these angels, Israel, or not Israel, the Christian church, they had a lot to be, uh, they had a lot against them. The early church had a lot going against them. They were not the predominant religion of their time, well, not like today. <clears throat> Our predominant religion in the United States is Christianity. But back then, we were considered atheists. The predominant religion was paganism. If you look at the circles I got you, I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's the Temple of Octavia. There's several gods here that they worship, a total of six. The only ones that are showing up, showing up on the slide is the Temple of Octavia, the Temple of Apollos, and then the other four are Heracles, um, Venus, Poseidon, and Hermes, all these gods were worshipped there. And then look how close they are to the, towards the marketplace. This is what sold, what, what sold in that day. The marketplace, they were buying gods, icons, you name it, relics. Um, and here we are, this one newfound faith that's rising up. And it's saying, no, all your gods stink compared to the God that we serve, who is Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is what we're declaring, but then here we are going, oh, but we can't, we can't resolve our own disputes. So we got to go to these guys that worship other gods, these pagans, to get righteous ruling, so-called righteous ruling, to, to resolve our disputes. That's hypocrisy. Can you imagine what the people back then were saying? It was like, look at these people that claim to be holier than thou. This, this one true church, these people that say that their God is the only God that reigns. And here they are coming to us with their dirty laundry. They got to come to us to fix their faucet. How embarrassing for the church. And that's why Paul is upset with this. This is why he's coming at them really strong. Even though I'm trying to come at it with not so strong of a blow. Um, he says, Paul says that we are going to rule over angels and over the world. I'm not going to go too deep on, on the angel stuff. But what you need to understand is we are the church, the ecclesia, right? Ecclesia means called out ones. We are going to rule like Christ ruled because of who Christ is. We, 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 are, we are heirs of Christ. We are going to rule and reign all of eternity with him, not just demons. I know some people think, oh, we're just going to rule over the demons. No, we're ruling over everything just like Christ is because we, we no longer take on it's not our righteousness that we, we carry. It's not our righteousness that we are, we are enveloped in. Whose righteousness covers us? Jesus. Whose righteousness washes us white as snow? It, yes, his righteousness. It's his blood that washes us and cleanses us and redeems us. So we get to stand before the, the Bema seat. Redeemed. We don't have to worry about standing before the great white throne judgment with God coming down with an iron fist. We have been redeemed at the cross. We've been washed white as snow at the cross. The cross is so important to our faith. It is that simple gospel that we live by. 
which we'll get into next week. So the bottom line is, like I said, we are the church. We have to live like the church that Christ desires us to live like. We are supposed to stand before believers and judge matters in the spirit of Christ and by God's standard. Just think how far some believers and churches have fallen in our day from their exalted position in Christ Jesus our Lord. May that not be our case. May we, as SRCC, continue to grow in the knowledge of the gospel of grace, lifting up one another, bearing each other's burdens. Live like the first church in Acts 2. What we have is not our own. It all belongs to Christ, and he, it's his will. Let his will be done in each and every one of our lives. And that allow, may the Lord glorify his name through this church so that this community that we live in, that we love, will see that there is a righteous and just God, and his name is Jesus, and he is worthy of all of our affection, of all of our attention. Amen. Father, we thank you so much. We give you glory. We give you honor. <clears throat> we love your word. Lord, that sometimes can be really hard to, to grasp, especially with how we walk in this world, trying to work out our salvation with trim, fear and trembling. Lord, learning to walk by faith and not by sight can sometimes be a challenge, especially with the things that the enemy comes and at us with. Remind us, Father, that